I guess I've got the camera on, so we're okay there. All right, so request to go through this process again, and I will do that um, to hopefully give you a, a big picture view of what's happening here. All right, so we have a response from outside the cell that is a first messenger that has bound to an appropriate 7TM receptor. As I said, I'm not going to talk about the receptor or what the messenger is here. But suffice it to say that this process has been activated by the first messenger binding to this target cell. Okay. Now, um, the binding of the uh, first messenger caused a shape change in a 7TM, which caused phospholipase C to become activated. Phospholipase C, in turn, converted this membrane uh, component called PIP2. It cleaved it into two pieces. One piece was IP3, which is the blue part that you see right there, and it went down into the cytoplasm. The other part that was left behind is diacylglycerol, and it's called DAG, and you can see with that little gray uh, thing right there. Okay. The movement of IP3 into the cytoplasm allows it to interact with a receptor on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that causes that receptor in the endoplasmic reticulum to open up. It's basically a pore, open or close. That's all it does. So when it binds to IP3, it opens up, and since there are a lot of calcium ions in here, the calcium ions are allowed to leave, and they come flowing out of the endoplasmic reticulum. The calcium ions go and they can cause a variety of things. Like I said, they can cause muscular contraction. They don't all have to go to this one place. But uh, in this case, they're going and binding to this enzyme called protein kinase C. That's important because the activation of protein kinase C requires two things. One, it requires calcium ions, which you see here. And second, it requires diacylglycerol, which was released in the first process. The combination of these two binding to protein kinase C allows protein kinase C to start phosphorylating target proteins and affecting their activity, turning some of them on, turning some of them off. Ultimately, these target proteins will exert a physiological response. Okay. Does that help? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the protein kinase uh, C system. It's also a 7TM, as I said, just like the um, uh, beta adrenergic receptor system, or the epinephrine system was that. The binding of calcium uh, is interesting and important uh, in the cell. And the reason uh, it's important is, uh, as I said, uh, calcium is um, something the cell has to be pretty careful with. So uh, calcium in high enough concentrations, like I said, will cause DNA to precipitate. The cell can't afford to have its DNA precipitate, so that's one of the reasons we see it sequestered into organelles like endoplasmic reticulum, like sarcoplasmic reticulum. And even when it comes out into the cell, there are proteins that will bind it and keep that free calcium concentration from being too high. We're saying, well, doesn't that defeat the purpose? If they bind to calcium, how's calcium concent concentration going to go up? Okay. Well, it's a good question. Um, part of the reason that there are proteins to bind it is some of these proteins, when they bind to calcium, participate in activating other proteins. So calcium is a second messenger for many processes. You've only seen one of them so far. And the proteins that bind to calcium have a very common feature about them. The common feature that they have is shown on the screen, and they look like a hand. This is called an EF hand, okay? The structure looks like a finger going up and a thumb coming out. Here's the thumb in the blue and the finger is up in yellow. And the calcium ion fits right here where my uh, little pocket is uh, in my hand, all right? That's the structure of um, a calcium binding protein. Now, one of the most common calcium binding proteins we have in the cell is known as calmodulin. And though it doesn't look exactly like it here, it in fact does have that binding site very much like what the EF hands figure showed us. Okay? Now, what this is depicting for us is the structural change that's happening in calmodulin when it binds to calcium. Okay? 
So here is the um, uh, uh, molecule. Here is the, cal the calmodulin when it's not bound to calcium. Here is the calmodulin after it is bound to calcium. And you'll notice that it has a sort of a, a little claw like this. This little claw serves to be a binding structure for target enzymes. So by having calcium bind to calmodulin and calmodulin bind to target enzymes, the target enzymes can be activated by calmodulin, not by calcium. That's good. Okay. So one of those target enzymes is called CAM kinase. It doesn't really matter for our purpose what it is. But suffice it to say that, that calmodulin is the activator. And it's only activating when calcium has been released. So again, calcium can be the signal, but the effect is modulated through calmodulin. Now, we will see that one of the proteins involved in glycogen breakdown responds to calmodulin. There are many, many proteins that respond to calmodulin. And in every case, they're responding to the fact that calmodulin has bound to calcium. Calcium is giving that signal for a process to go forwards. OK. Well, it's time to talk about some other uh, receptors. And now I'm going to turn away from 7TMs. There are hundreds of 7TMs in our cells. Okay. But I want to talk about another very important hormone signaling system that you've heard about and that is essential for our body. And it's the signaling system that is ultimately uh, initiated by insulin. So insulin is a very important hormone in the body. Insulin is released by our pancreas when the blood glucose levels start to rise. Well, when do blood glucose levels start to rise? After we've eaten a meal, after we've gotten something that's got a fair amount of glucose in it. Now, there's the first clue to you that glucose is a poison, OK? This body is releasing insulin, and the effect of insulin is to stimulate cells to take up glucose. They're taking up glucose to lower the blood glucose concentration. And that's important because if not, if we don't lower the blood glucose concentration, we will have severe effects. People who have diabetes have high blood glucose levels and they get high blood glucose levels, and what happens? They can lose their vision, they can lose their kidneys, they can lose their limbs. Glucose is a poison. Well, if cells are taking up a poison, aren't they going to die? No. When they take up glucose, they make glycogen. That's why they make glycogen. They take up glucose so that they are not having it out in the bloodstream where it can kill cells. It kills cells by disrupting osmotic pressures. Inside the cell, it's converted to glycogen, and it sits there merrily. No problem. So insulin is protecting the body against the harmful effects of having high concentrations of glucose in the bloodstream. Very important point. The signaling process I'm going to describe to you tells you how that happens. But suffice it to say, the body doesn't control levels of glucose. The body is in deep doo-doo. Very deep due to people die of diabetes. People have, as I say, organ failure. They have many problems that can arise, and they arise because of the high concentrations of glucose. Well, how does insulin exert its effects? Okay. Insulin, like all hormones, insulin's a first messenger. Remember that it's released by the pancreas. It travels into the bloodstream, and it goes to target tissues. Those target tissues will include muscle and liver, among others. But for right now, we're going to talk about muscle and liver. And when they hit muscle or liver cells, they bind to a receptor. Okay, They bind to a receptor. So the receptor is called an insulin receptor. Insulin receptor is involved in a million processes. It's probably one of the most active receptors on cells. When insulin binds to the insulin receptor, we're going to see some changes that are going to happen in the receptor, just like we saw changes happen in the beta-adrenergic receptor. 
except for in this case, the receptor is going to affect itself. It's going to, it's going to alter itself is what's going to happen. You'll notice that the insulin receptor is a dimer. Okay? It exists like this in the membrane. It has a cytoplasmic region down here. It has an extracellular region up here. The extracellular region, of course, is where the insulin actually binds. This guy always is found in the membrane as a dimer, okay? but it's not in the active form until insulin binds it. So when it's sitting there in the membrane by itself, it's not doing anything. And upon activation, that, not what I want. That is, upon the binding of insulin, here's what happens. Okay, now this is kind of a mouthful of stuff, so bear with me. Insulin has bound to the insulin receptor on the top uh, scheme. That's the little green ball that you see there. The binding of insulin causes the receptor to change the arrangement of the two subunits that it has, the two identical subunits. That arrangement is slightly changed. Okay? So just like other proteins that we've seen whose shape gets changed by binding of a substrate, in this case, the binding of this hormone causes the insulin receptor to change the way those two subunits are interacting with each other. The insulin receptor is an enzyme. It's normally inactive, meaning it doesn't catalyze anything unless insulin is there. Insulin causes the receptor to do something odd. Okay? It literally forces a portion of one side of the receptor into the active site of the other. And I'll tell you what the reaction is in a minute. But We've got these, these receptors are sitting here minding their own business. We've got an active site over here. We've got an active site over here. And neither one of them is doing anything because nothing is making its way into either one of them. The binding of the receptor has caused one of them to change shape so that a portion of the other receptor is forced into the active site of the other one. So we can say in this case, the one on the right is getting forced into the active site of the left. The active site of the left is therefore stimulated to catalyze a reaction on this portion of the other receptor that's been stuck into it. Well, what's the reaction that it catalyzes? The reaction that it catalyzes is the portion of the, of the, the right guy that got put into the left, it stuck a tyrosine into the active site. The action of the insulin receptor is it's known as a tyrosine kinase. More specifically, it's known as a receptor tyrosine kinase. As its name would suggest, a tyrosine kinase would put phosphates onto a tyrosine. And the addition of the phosphate, whoa, the addition, oh, is that you? I thought it was above us. I thought, is the sky falling or what? <laughs> the addition of that phosphate to that tyrosine of the guy on the right now causes it to phosphorylate the one on the left. So one phosphorylates the first one. Now the, the first one that got phosphorylated, oh wow, I'm active. I'm going to start phosphorylating the other guy. And it phosphorylates the other receptor. So they've now each mutually phosphorylated their own respective tyrosines. This causes each enzyme to become very active. They go on a phosphorylation parade. They phosphorylate each other in here. They phosphorylate each other up here. And the phosphorylation of this guy up here provides targets for proteins to bind. OK? Now, the rest of the events that happen in the signaling process involve both phosphorylation and binding of protein to protein to protein to protein and ultimately to uh, activation of a kinase. Now, I'm going to step you through that, but I want the big picture is insulin's bound, receptor got activated, and now we're going to start making a series of binding events that's going to result in the activation of a, a target kinase. Okay. Well, this phosphate up here is a target for 
a protein known as IRS1. In each case, the phosphates that you see on all the molecules up here, all of the phosphates have been placed onto tyrosines. Okay. There are specific structures inside of some proteins that recognize only phosphotyrosine. They see tyrosine, they won't bind. They see phosphotyrosine, they will bind. So what happened? Was IRS1 came up here and it says, oh, I've got a binding site for phosphotyrosine, I bind to it. Okay. That segment of IRS1 that, bound, that binds phosphotyrosine is called an SH2 domain. That's a portion of the protein that recognizes phosphotyrosine. So SH2 domain right there binds to the phosphotyrosine here. This now holds the IRS1 close to this enzyme, and guess what this enzyme does? It puts these phosphates on here that you see, and it's putting phosphates onto tyrosines again. Well, these phosphotyrosines are a target for another SH2 domain over here on this enzyme called phospholinositide 3 kinase. Okay. Phosphoinositide 3 kinase phosphorylates PIP2. There's our friend PIP2 again. Only in this case, it's putting a phosphate on instead of clipping anything, and it makes PIP3. Oh, yes, I will go over this again. Don't worry. PIP3 acts like a messenger for this enzyme called PDK1. PDK1 is a kinase. It's a protein kinase and it in turn phosphorylates AKT to make it become active. So now we've activated another kinase. This guy down here is able to travel throughout the cell and exert its effects. Now I'm going to tell you what those effects are in a second. You'll start to see how this comes together in a, in a second. But before we get to those effects, we have to just see this as a sequence of events that's happening. So I am going to take you through it again and um, hopefully uh, clarify. All right, insulin is bound. Binding of insulin caused the receptor to basically phosphorylate itself. It phosphorylated itself on both sides on tyrosines. The phosphotyrosines were targets for this protein called IRS1. IRS1 bound to the phosphotyrosine through its SH2 domain. That brought this tail into close proximity of the enzyme, which now put phosphates onto the tail. The phosphates on the tail were targets for binding of the SH2 domain of phosphoinositide 3 kinase. That caused the kinase to become active and start to phosphorylate PIP2. PIP2 became PIP3, which was necessary for activation of PDK1. PDK1, in turn, phosphorylated AKT. And I'll stop for questions before I get to the stunning climax of this process. Everybody exhausted with that? Everyone a joke? Okay, let me think. Um, Let's see. I have one. <laughs> I've lost my joke. I told you my arty joke. Okay. How about um, this guy's walking along the street, and he looks down, and he discovers this magic vase at his feet. And he looks at the magic vase, and he grabs it, and he rubs it, of course, and you know what happens. Then a genie pops out, right? And the genie says, oh, says, you know, I will grant you three wishes, of course. What would you like? And he says, well, he says, um, I want to have a billion dollars. Poof! In his hands appears this certificate giving him $1 billion in a Swiss bank account. Wow, this is awesome. Okay? And he says, 
Well, he says, uh, Jesus says, what would you like next, O oh Master? And he says, um, I think um, um, I would like to be a very powerful person. Poof! He becomes the president of the biggest corporation in America. Wow! You know, Jeannie says, well, how about number three? And he says, well, let me think about this for a minute. He says, I've got money. Let's see, I've got power. He says, I want every woman to love me. Poof! He turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> Bad joke. Okay, how about a better joke than that? I'll give you one more joke. Okay, we got, we got time. All right. So, this is the one I was, I was going to tell you, and I couldn't remember it. All right, so this lady goes to this pet shop, right? And she decides that she wants to buy her husband a great present for his birthday. Anybody heard this joke? Okay. Great present for his birthday. So gets to the pet shop and tells the, the pet shop owner, I want to buy my husband this really great present, something different than usual. And the pet shop owner says, I got it for you. He walks back, and he brings out an iguana on a leash, great big iguana. The lady looks at it, and she says, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. That's what I want, you know. And so he says, okay, he takes it back, you know. And he comes out, and he gets got this, like, this 10-foot anaconda, okay. And this guy brings it out, and there's a slithering snake and everything. And the lady says, yeah, I don't think I want to have that around the house, you know. So this goes on, and he brings out every animal he can think of. And, you know, she says, no, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. This goes on for quite a while. And finally, he's getting exasperated. He says, I know what you need. He says, you need a crunch bird. She says, what's a crunch bird? He says, oh, you see that little bird in the perch over there? And uh, she says, yeah. And he says, watch this. He says, crunch bird, chair. He points over this chair. And this bird jumps up off his perch, and he flies over this chair and demolishes the chair right in front of the lady's eyes. And she says, that little bird, that's incredible. You have heard this, right? I've heard something similar. OK. <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> And uh, he says, you ain't seen anything yet. He says, crunch bird, desk. And there's this great, big, old, beautiful wooden desk over in the corner. And this bird flies over the desk. And in, in literally a minute, it splitters. She says, my god. She says, this is amazing. She says, I got to get this for my husband. He's going to love this thing. She goes walking home. And she's got the little bird on her finger. And she walks in, you know. And, and he's sitting there reading paper. And rah, 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 rah. Honey, I got you something for your birthday. What is it? He says, it's a crutch bird. He says, crutch bird, my ass. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> was that the joke you heard? It was different, but similar. Yeah. <laughs> I won't ask what no. your punchline was. <laughs> OK. All right, does this make sense? Now, we're not, we're not done with this yet. There's more. But I felt like you needed a break before I got to the more. The more is actually cool. The more is simple. I shouldn't say simple, but the more is interesting. All right? Now, um, what happens in this process is we've gone through here. Insulin is bound. We've activated a receptor. We've phosphorylated these proteins. We've localized this guy to the membrane so it can start converting PIP2 into PIP3. It activated. This, uh, there's PIP3. It activated this kinase, which activated this kinase. And you see several arrows. You'll notice I'm sparing you what each of those arrows do. Those arrows re result in the movement of glucose transporter to the cell surface. So what has happened? Insulin has stimulated the movement of glucose transporters to the cell surface. And what do glucose transporters do? They bring glucose into the cell. This is how insulin lowers blood glucose. They stimulate cells to move their receptors to the surface, take glucose out of the bloodstream, and put it into the cell where it can be built into glycogen, and thereby reduce the toxic effects of glucose. Make sense? OK, so again, it's just a series of steps. This goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. Bang, we ultimately uh, result in this happening. OK, um, there's an SH2 domain. That's the thing that binds phosphotyrosine, as I told you. Um, nothing much more to say about it than that. And we don't need to worry about that. OK, now I've got 
Uh, what the heck is with that? I have uh, another signaling pathway that I want to talk about that is important in cellular decisions to uh, whether or not to divide. And as we shall see, these, this pathway, if it goes awry, can cause severe problems, including cancer. Okay? So it's important to recognize that now we're going to think about processes that um, are ultimately involved in helping the cells to decide, should I divide or not divide? Very important thing for cell to decide. All right. Well, this is uh, part. Some of these are mediated through this hormone called epidermal growth factor, or EGF, as you see here. It's a peptide hormone, just like insulin was a peptide hormone, only it's different, obviously. And epidermal growth factor is released. There's a structural consideration. Okay, and I'm calling this the hormone. Actually, that's the re the receptor. That's not what I want. Hold on. Sorry. Nope, that's not what I want. Here, okay. So, epidermal growth factor is a hormone that binds to the epidermal growth factor receptor. Right? So the receptor, just like the insulin receptor, is a membrane protein. It has an extracellular domain, and it has an intracellular domain. Now, it's similar to the insulin receptor in that it also is a tyrosine kinase. It's a receptor tyrosine kinase. What we find is that receptor tyrosine kinases are very intimately involved in control processes in the cell. Insulin receptor, as I said, does many other things. You only saw the movement of the receptor here. Most tyrosine kinases are involved in important cellular controls very important cellular controls, and many of those controls are involved in replication or no replication. Epidermal growth factor receptor, it's called EGF receptor, is the guy in yellow. EGF is the little guy in purple. All right. Epidermal growth factor receptor is a membrane protein, but in contrast to the insulin receptor, it does not normally exist as a dimer in the membrane. Normally, each one of these units is floating around the membrane all by itself. Only after the receptor, or at least the half of the receptor, has bound to EGF can it bind to another half of the receptor that is also bound to EGF. If there's no EGF, these guys are floating freely. They're not linked to each other. You can see this little red loop here. The binding of EGF to the receptor causes that red loop to stick out so they can actually interact with each other. If there's no EGF, the red loop contracts and they don't interact with each other. So it's through that red loop that they're, they're held together. Okay, what has happened here? Epidermal growth factor has bound to its receptor. It's bound to each half of its receptor. And now, as a consequence, these two guys are linked and just like we saw with the insulin receptor, they're both tyrosine kinases, and they phosphorylate each other when they're brought next to each other. The phosphorylation of each other causes there to be binding sites for proteins that have, guess what kind of a domain? SH2 domains. All right? Here's an SH2 domain of this protein called GERB2 that's binding to the receptor. GERB2 is interacting with this protein called SOS. SOS is binding to this protein called RAS. And RAS is becoming activated. And does this look familiar like anything you've seen before? You betcha. RAS is a protein that's very much like a G protein. It's very much like a G protein. Now, RAS becomes activated when its GDP gets replaced by GTP. And activated RAS will stimulate cells to divide. So when this signaling process has happened, it, it's, it's a long ways before the this decision to divide happens. But activated RAS happens bef as, as, as part of the signal to tell cells to divide. So we can imagine there's a bunch of steps after this, and there are. 
But this part right here is critical. The activation of RAS. So the hormone is bound. The hormone, the uh, receptor uh, phosphorylates itself. This binds, G GERB2 binds, then SOS binds, then RAS binds. GTP gets GDP gets replaced by GTP, and RAS is active. Now, this is really interesting process. We're seeing now a signaling system that's telling the cell, I want you to divide. If you're a growing child, for example, and you need to make new bone cells, this, this is a great way to say, we've got to build bigger, stronger bones. We've got to make more bones. Okay? Keep going, keep going. That signal, that hormone signal to divide is, tele is coming through RAS. Now RAS, as you might imagine, plays a very important role in the cell. In fact, all these guys play a very important role in the cell. As long as everybody is playing nicely, this system works very well. All right? I'm going to tell you in a minute what happens when this system doesn't go very nicely. Well, I told you that RAS acts like a G protein. Your first question should probably be, does it cleave GTP? And the answer is, yes, it does. That's how it turns itself off. So this RAS will go, it'll activate cell division, it turns itself off, and it goes back and we start this process again if necessary, or if not, no more division. Okay? What happens if we screw this system up? Well, let's imagine a couple ways that we might screw this system up. All right? The, most, the best known one is what happens if I make a mutant form of RAS? What if my cells suffer a mutation such that RAS is altered? This is known. It turns out the active site of RAS, there's a couple of amino acids at about position 11 and 12 on the amino acid sequence that are absolutely critical for RAS function. Function being cleaving GTP back to GDP, acting as an inefficient enzyme. Alteration of either of those amino acids causes RAS to be unable to cleave GTP. This is big problem. RAS binds GTP. It can't turn itself off. What's it going to cause the cell to do? It's going to cause the cell to divide uncontrollably. This can be one way in which we get uncontrolled growth, ultimately resulting in a cancer and or a tumor. RAS can't turn itself off, we've got problems. Okay? How else might this system get screwed up? What if we had a mutant epidermal growth factor receptor that didn't require epidermal growth factor to interact? That signal now is going to be made all the time. It's going to be making this go, it's going to be making this go. Again, we're going to have uncontrollable growth. When we look at processes that are involved in controlling growth, if we screw up those processes, we may be turning on growth all the time. That's a big, big problem for cells. Okay. Now, I want to tell you about a related protein and an interesting story relating to uh, anti-cancer treatment. Okay. There's a related, so I told you that the EGF receptor, for example, exists as monomers in the membrane. Okay. It doesn't normally do this until it's bound to two of these. There's a related receptor in the cell that's called HER, H-E-R. HER is present in reasonably low levels, but HER can also interact with EGF receptor and stimulate this process. At a low level, this probably happens all the time. Regular cell division, fine. All right? We're not going excessive. We're not having to respond to hormones. We're just saying, OK, it's time to divide. HER interacts with EGF receptor. HER doesn't require EGF. HER does not require EGF. So it's floating around in the membrane. Every now and then, it bumps into a receptor and says, OK, let's stimulate this process. And every now and then, that cell decides to divide. As long as you have a low enough level of HER, no problem. It's probably part of normal cell division. Okay? Well, what if the cell has a mutation 
that causes it to make a lot of her. Well, if you have a lot of her, the likelihood her is going to bump into EGF receptor increases. The more that happens, the more this process happens, the more stimulation that we get, the less control we have over growth, and the more problems we're going to have as a consequence. Overstimulation of production of HER is not uncommon in breast cancer. There are many mechanisms for breast cancer, but one of them is that the HER receptor can, in fact, be overstimulated to be produced. That's stimulating cell division way more than it should. As a consequence, we could imagine big problems, and in fact, we do have big problems. That's the bad news. The good news <clears throat> is that HER-related cancers are fairly easily treated thanks to um, a monoclonal antibody that's been made called Herceptin. Anybody ever know anybody who's had Herceptin? Anybody ever heard of Herceptin? Okay, yeah, all right. So Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody. It's, it's a special kind of antibody that's designed to bind to one and only one thing, and it's designed to bind to the Her receptor. <clears throat> now the beauty of this <clears throat> is it doesn't bind to anything else. And when given to cancer patients, if they, in fact, have a, have a tumor that results from overexpression of HER, it's A, very effective in essentially stopping the tumor in its tracks, and B, very, very few side effects because it's really designed to bind to one thing. As a consequence, this uh, is one anti-cancer treatment that really works very well and doesn't cause much in the way of other effects uh, that, that happen, okay? So our knowledge of signaling pathways is very helpful in our understanding the progress by which cells go for uncontrollable growth, okay? How am I doing on time? Oh my goodness, I'm really doing good on time today, okay. All right, questions about that? Okay, moving along. Uh, what else did I want to say here? Uh, I guess I did show you this already, but again, what you saw was um, that was the process that led ultimately, oh, I'm sorry, that was, I got insulin, duh, sorry. Uh, no, that's EGF, I'm sorry, uh, that, that was insulin, okay. So here's uh, the process that happens. There's a lot of things on here I haven't talked about. You're not responsible for all this down here, but you can see that this signaling pathway is fairly complicated, and we see uh, activation of RAS. RAS activates something called RAF, activates something called MEC, activates ERK, and these result ultimately in the phosphorylation of transcription factors that now change gene expression. And gene expression change is important when a cell decides to divide. It doesn't want to have everything ready for replication all the time. Only when it's ready for replication should it do that. And so those genes have to be turned on at the appropriate time. And that's what this process is uh, activated to do. Okay. All right, now I need to give you a little terminology here. Uh, maybe you've heard about it in other classes. Uh, maybe not, so I'll make sure everybody's heard the same stuff. Um, RAS is, a, is an excellent example of a cellular protein that is intimately involved in important processes. It's an example of uh, its importance is shown by the fact that if we mutate it in the appropriate place, the cell loses all control it becomes, it, 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 may, it, it, it is stimulated to divide uncontrollably. Cells have very rigorous controls on deciding to divide or not to divide, but a mutated RAS messes that up, okay? RAS is uh, one of a series of actually a few hundred proteins that have such essential functions that if we screw them up, we screw up the ability to control division. This group of proteins all has a common name. They're called proto-oncogenes. RAS is a proto-oncogene. I'll explain what an oncogene is in a minute. But a proto-oncogene is a gene intimately involved in cellular control. And if I screw up that control, the cell is going to divide uncontrollably. There are hundreds of these. RAS is one example. Okay. Now, when I mutate RAS, I convert it from a proto-oncogene into something we call an oncogene. You probably have heard of oncogenes. Oncogenes 
are called genes that cause cancer. People mistakenly say that, well, you're full of oncogenes. Your body is already full of oncogenes. Your body is full of proto-oncogenes. They have to be mutated to become an oncogene. Right? So if we take a normal uh, gene that is intimately involved in controlling cell division, for example, we alter its function, we've mutated it, we've converted it from a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. So an oncogene is a mutated proto-oncogene, and that mutated proto-oncogene causes the cell to divide uncontrollably. There are hundreds of these in your genome. RAS is a really interesting one. It's one that I always tell students, it scares me. I'll tell you why it scares me, okay? I told you that if I mutate one of those amino acids, 11 or 12 in RAS, I can convert RAS from a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. In fact, if I convert any one of either of those amino acids into any other amino acid, RAS becomes an oncogene. That RAS can lead to that simply that one transformation of that one amino acid in one RAS can cause that cell to divide uncontrollably. It's been shown in mice, for example, that you can do exactly what I just said and cause a tumor to form in a mouse. Now, I'm going to tell you the scare part of it, and then I'm going to hopefully take away a little bit of the scare. You say, well, what's the chance of mutating that one thing? Well, you know, if we think about how many base pairs we have in the human genome, there are 7 billion base pairs, right? So I've got, if I'm going to have a mutation, one in 7 billion mutations, you know, I got plenty to spare, right? And if, I'm, if I have a mutation rate of once every, let's say, 10 to the ninth, Okay, which is about a, which is about a billion also, then one in a billion of one in a billion, okay, is when I'm going to get mutation. So a billion billion uh, is in the order of quadrillions. You say, well, I feel pretty safe, but then you realize how many trillions of cells you have in your body, and how often replication is going on. You're probably making RAS oncogenes fairly frequently. You make them more frequently when you do things that stimulate mutagenesis. These include things like smoking cigarettes. They include things like going to tanning booths. I am absolutely amazed and appalled at the number of young people who go to tanning booths. You'll, Dr. Merrill will talk next term about why going to tanning booths is really nasty to your DNA. It screws up the repair system. Should I not go out in the sun at all? No, you should get a little bit of tan. It's not like saying you shouldn't do that, but tanning booths give you short wavelength ultraviolet light that are very mutagenic. I went to a tanning booth. I'm okay. I only smoked one cigarette. I'm okay. <laughs> right? right? It's a numbers game. The more you, you roll the dice, the more likely you're, it is you're going to lose. And so if there's one message I can communicate to my students, it's stay out of the goddamn tanning booths. Okay? Because they're going to be nothing but trouble for you down the line. Okay. Um, get off my high horse here and get back to talking about biochemistry. Okay, any questions or comments about what I've said so far here? No? Okay, well I want to talk about one more system. I'm actually in pretty good shape. Talk about one more system then we're going to call it a day. And this one other system is a very interesting and important um, phenomenon. I'm not going to go through all the signaling so you can, you can rest assured with that. Um, but it's an important, uh, it affects an important protein in the signaling process, okay? In a, type, a certain type of leukemia commonly found in children, okay, there is a chromosomal rearrangement that occurs. So cells are constantly rearranging, recombining, doing all kinds of things with their chromosomes. One of the common rearrangements that can happen that can result in leukemia is a crossover that can happen between a region of chromosome 9 and a region of human chromosome 12. This rearrangement occurs, it fuses a portion 
of a gene called BCR with a tyrosine kinase known as ABL, ABL. And ABL is a tyrosine kinase that is um, um, important in uh, signaling process. It's important in helping cells to decide whether to divide or not. Okay, Important in helping cells to decide whether to divide or not. Normally, ABL does its thing. It responds to signals. It phosphorylates some stuff and helps cells make that decision about to divide or not to divide. Okay? Now, um, when this recombination happens, the control region of ABL, uh, of BCR, that is the promoter region of ABL, and the end terminus of ABL is fused to the tyrosine kinase portion, uh, I'm sorry, of BCR is fused to the tyrosine kinase portion of ABL. So we have part of BCR here, we have part of ABL here, and now we've got a new protein. Well, this guy turns out to act like an oncogene. ABL by itself didn't act like an oncogene unless you did something to it, and here's the something that you did to it. It turns out that BCR is made in the cell at much higher levels than ABL itself is. And since the, the control region of BCR is being fused along with BCR to ABL, we're making a new gene, and that new gene has tyrosine kinase activity, it is very active, okay, and it is um, contributing to the signaling process and causing a problem. Okay? Everybody with me? Now, that's the bad news. That gives rise to leukemia and causes a problem. Right? The good news is that we actually are able to treat this uh, cancer fairly readily with a compound that uh, does something to this. What kind of a compound do you suppose we would want to use to treat this with? What's that? Okay, something to silence. What do you mean by silence? Uh, not quite a methylase, no. How would we, if we were to design something to stop this process from happening, what would we have to do? What's that? Well, the three combinations already happened. So we've got the leukemia. It's already happened. We've got, this, we've got this cell that's got this thing. Now, you're right. If we prevented that recombination from happening, we wouldn't have had this problem. But the recombination has happened. And so now we've got this, this protein that's being made in high quantities. And it's telling the cell all the time, divide, divide, divide. We've got leukemia. We have a problem. What we want is an inhibitor of the tyrosine kinase. We want this tyrosine kinase to not be able to put phosphates on tyrosine. And, and this is the real advantage we have, is that we, this is a new protein. This is a protein that didn't exist in a regular cell. Perhaps we can use a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that might affect this, but not have effects on other tyrosine kinases. All right? There is such an inhibitor. That is known. It was actually invented by a professor up at OHSU. Anybody know what the, anybody know what the inhibitor is? It's called Gleevec. G-L-E-E-V-E-C. It binds here, and it appears to bind to this guy preferentially compared to other tyrosine kinases. Gleevec has, again, relatively low chemotherapy side effects because it's working mostly on a protein that isn't present in normal cells. So, thanks to Gleevec, a lot of childhood leukemias and other uh, leukemias as well are in fact treatable um, as a result of their ability to stop this overactive signaling process from happening and the body can, can exert its effects. Okay, now, um, I have a song if you want a song? Yeah. A song? Okay. The song actually requires one other signaling thing I haven't told you, so let me, let me tell you what that is first. So, uh, then, then you'll understand the song, okay? Uh, in this uh, process, okay, in this process of epinephrine signaling, 
We'll talk later in the class about another protein that actually can stimulate the same process. It's called glucagon. And we will see that that will come up in this song, I believe, if I recall correctly. All right. This is a song to the tune of an old Simon and Garfunkel tune called The Sound of Silence. Anybody know the song? Okay. Uh, why is that way over there? Okay. So it's kind of, it's fairly easy to sing if you know the tune. If not, just kind of hum along and we'll go there. It goes, biochemistry, my friend, it's time to study you again. Mechanisms that I need to know are the things that really stress me so. Get these pathways planted firmly in your head. Ahern said, let's start with epinephrine. Membrane proteins are well known. Changed on binding this hormone. Rearranging cells without protest. Stimulating a G alpha S to go open up and displace its GDP with GTP because of epinephrine. Active G then moves away, stimulating adcyclase. So a bunch of cyclic AMP binds to kinase and then sets it free. All the active sites of the kinases await triphosphate because of epinephrine. Muscles are affected then, breaking down their glycogen. So they get a watt of energy in the form of lots of G1P and the synthases that could make a glucose chain. All refrain because of epinephrine. Now I've reached the pathway end, going from adrenaline. Here's a trick I learned to get it right, linking memory to flight or fright. So the mechanism that's the source of anxious fears reappears when I make epinephrine. Okay, I thought I had glucose gun in it. I guess it didn't. Okay. So, the G1 people make more sense later. So, all right. Let you guys be. Have fun, and I will see you on a hot. It's supposed to be hot tomorrow. Dress accordingly. See you then. <laughs>